I'm Liam Dolan and I work at Oxford University and my research group is interested in understanding the events that occurred around half a billion years ago when plants colonised the land. We're using genetics, paleontology, biogeochemistry, all sorts of different techniques to try to understand precisely the events that took place at that key stage in Earth history. What's great about science at the moment is that we've got so many tools and capabilities that we can begin to answer questions that we couldn't have answered 10 years ago. What excites me about science is the opportunity to answer really interesting questions that relate to the importance of plant life on the planet. So, for example, land plants colonised the continental surfaces around half a billion years ago. And we know squat about that process. Half a billion years ago uh, and before, the majority of life existed in the oceans. Okay, so animals lived in the oceans. Uh, plants grew in the oceans as, as algae. And then, for reasons that we don't know, plants began to colonise the wet surfaces next to rivers and lakes. And within a hundred million years, you had extensive forests. So we went, so the continental surfaces went from being uh, sandy, rocky places to being covered in vegetation. And beneath this vegetation were soils. So not only did the colonization of plants lead to the evolution of land plants, but they led to the formation of the first complex soils. So if it wasn't for the colonization of the land by plants, there wouldn't have been a colonization of the land by animals. Uh, if you think about it, animals need food and ultimately plants are their source of food. So if all of their source of food are the the energy in food webs existed in the ocean, well that's where the animals would, would largely stay, or in the air over the ocean. Uh, but when plants colonised the land, you had plants, these big green organisms, that transformed the sun's energy into chemical energy by reducing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. And this source of chemical energy is what plants use to build their bodies, and it's plant bodies that animals eat. So ultimately, the development of a terrestrial ecosystem where animals were important depended on plants being there first. And you can extend that all the way to human civilization, because if it wasn't for the colonization of the plants and the subsequent colonization by the animals, there'd be no human civilization as we know it. So when plants colonised the land, they found themselves in a new and an alien environment, if you like. Previously, plants had inhabited these water bodies and they were surrounded in, in water, surrounded in nutrient, and they were supported by the water body in which they lived. But then as plants moved onto land, not only were they growing in the air, they weren't physically supported by a, a water body, but they also were not surrounded by nutrient-rich medium. So they needed to develop ways to extract nutrients from the soil. So it's at this time that we see the first evidence for rooting systems. In order to understand processes early in land-plant evolution, we need two pieces of information. One is we need to know what fossil plants looked like, or we need to know what ancient plants looked like, and we use fossils to help us do that. We can look at relatives, extant relatives of those uh, early diverging land plants that live today, such as the, the mosses and the liverworts. But these mosses and liverworts aren't ancient plants, they're related to the ancient plants. So we need to use fossils to get an image of what these ancient plants look like. And then we can compare them to close relatives that live today. So in order to have a full picture of the diversity of plants 
and in our case of the rooting systems that occurred in these plants, we need to have access to the fossil record. And we're very lucky because there are great collections of fossils uh, around museums uh, that we have access to and that we can use to begin to reconstruct what some of these fossils might look like. So for example, there are these giant trees that lived in the Carboniferous forests. So these were the first trees to reach 50 meters in height. And they're the organisms that are responsible for the majority of coal that's been mined in Wales, Yorkshire, Scotland, Lancashire. And it was thought that these trees were really unusual in not having filamentous cells from the surface of the root because they'd never been described. But because their most closely related living species have root hairs, we hypothesized that they would have had these cells, but just people hadn't seen them. So we went back to these 100-year-old fossils and began to look with uh, microscopes uh, for these cell types. And I know from my other research experience that they're quite hard to find. Even in living plants, they can be hard to find. So with the patience that we've gained from looking at living plants, we looked at these fossils and we found them. So there they were. So these are structures that are you know, fundamental to most plants, but, but scientists had missed them for years. But with our expertise, we were able to go in and, and identify them. And so that was a beautiful story that we were able to fill in this little black box where it was thought that these cells didn't exist. And so on our family tree of land plants, we've been able to tick a box over these arborescent, these woody lycophyte plants and say, yes, they did have root hairs. Okay. So that's how we can use the fossils. So we know the, the, the distribution of these traits. We know what plants had these uh, structures and therefore that informs our genetic analysis. So now having identified and shown that these ancient monsters, these giant trees had root hairs, now we're going to pursue that and try to define the genetic mechanism controlling the formation of the hairs in their, uh, their living relatives now. The other major approach, and this has been at the heart of everything we've done, has been to use genetic analysis to understand how these filamentous cells at the interface between the plant and the soil uh, develop. And We've used a variety of different species. And we've used a variety of different species because if you imagine, the aim of our research is to reconstruct a genetic mechanism that existed half a million, billion years ago. And you know, there's no way we can do genetics on an extinct organism. But what we can do is we can look at the diversity of organisms that are derived from that common ancestor. So the most ancestral plants such as the mosses, liverworts and hornworts, these simple bryophytes on the one hand, and then the uh, seed plants on the other hand. And if we carry out genetic analysis here and here and define the genes that control the formation of these structures in both types of organism, then what's shared between these organisms is likely inherited from their common ancestor. So by doing genetic analysis on distantly related groups of living organisms, we can reconstruct a genetic system in an organism that's been extinct for half a billion years. 